Alan Blair, a former pastor and author in the early to mid-1900s, uh, on the radio for decades, and uh, well known, I have all of his books, I had the privilege of preaching his funeral, and he, uh, he told the story of a, of a pastor he knew who always seemed to be overflowing in gratitude for something. He pastored a little church in a farming community, and everyone knew him for his, uh, his thankful spirit. And every time the congregation met, uh, they knew there was this traditional pastoral prayer, and they knew their pastor would thank God for something. And uh, he rarely repeated himself. In fact, his specific thanks to God had become something they anticipated a hearing. I wonder what he's going to thank God about today. No matter what the circumstances, he found something for which to give God uh, thanks. One particular Sunday uh, brought, Blair writes, an unexpected snowstorm along with uh, sharp, bitter winds that blew in from the north, kind of uh, similar to maybe a little bit of what we got minus the snow, but as the little flock rode their horse-drawn carts or trudged through the snow to church, Blair writes, they wondered what in the world could the pastor possibly be thankful for on such a day. As the service opened, he stood to pray. They couldn't help but smile when they heard him pray, Heavenly Father, we thank you that not every day is as bad as this one. <laughs> well, maybe that's your prayer today. Uh, every day is not as bad as this one. Well, Peter is writing a letter to people in the first century who couldn't imagine anything really to be thankful for. They're facing a snowstorm of doubt and trouble, suffering. Uh, these snowdrifts of trials have just sort of mounted up before them. They're, they're, many of them are homeless. They're scattered throughout Pontus and Galatia and Cappadocia and uh, Asia and Bithynia. Uh, they're, they're sort of trudging through life against these bitter winds of growing sorrow and, and persecution. This is not what they had expected. And Peter picks up his quill. And, and after some opening comments that we've looked at in these last few weeks, he begins to remind them of things for which they can give God thanks. And it's so profound, especially as you consider uh, their situation. In fact, his opening statement in verse 3, let's go there, chapter 1 of 1 Peter and verse 3. It's really nothing less than a doxology. Notice, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, blessed be God. You can actually get word of the word, rid of the word be, that's implied, blessed God. Blessed is God. Blessed be God is the idea. You could well read this as an exclamation that simply says, thank God. Thank God. We bless you, God. Now the word for blessed here is from the word eulogetos, which gives us our word eulogy. That's where you say nice things about people in our culture. It's usually after they've gone on. But when you say nice things about people, even those who are living, you're eulogizing of them. Now, in one sense, God doesn't really need us to bless him. He doesn't need us to say nice things about him so he feels better about himself, right? So he can stay motivated on the job. So let's keep him incentivized. Say, say a few nice things about him. And that isn't God. Peter is simply setting an example that is good for us. It's good for us to say, thank God. Blessed be God. Even if it's something like, Lord, I'm glad every season of life is not as bad as this one. Especially when the bitter winds blow and the trials drift high. What Peter does following this statement is he basically sets off a chain of, of events, a chain of things or issues here that sort of trip over each other for which we can praise God and he wants us to follow his example. But before we do, let me just quickly address one particular issue that might trouble you when you read that, that opening statement. It's this reference to God the Father as Jesus is God. Blessed be the God and Father of our 
Lord Jesus Christ. If Jesus has a God, then he obviously isn't one, right? Well, whenever you see this kind of phrase, the apostles are providing both the human perspective and the divine perspective of Jesus Christ. From the Lord's human nature or perspective, God the Father is his God. From the Lord's divine perspective as God the Son, God is his Father. That is, he has the very divine nature of the Father. That's why he could say, if you see the Father, you see me. If you see me, you see the Father. I come and I express the glory of the Father, he says. So the word God here expresses the Lord's relationship as the Son of Man. The word Father expresses the Lord's relationship as the Son of God. So both the Lord's humanity and His deity are carried forward in this statement. And listen, without being both true, without both of them being true, our salvation would be impossible. There's really nothing to thank God about or nothing to trust in Christ. He had to be man in order to die, but He had to be God in order to die for us. Both are important. Now, with that doxology expressed, Peter basically sets off this chain reaction of praise. And he's going to point out several truths that lead us to thank God. And, and each word, by the way, is nuanced. We could spend a lot of time on each word and each phrase, and we're actually going to cover verse 3, verse 4, and verse 5. The first is simply this. God's great mercy gives us new life. God's great mercy gives us new life. Notice verse 3 again. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His great mercy has caused us to be born. Again, let's stop there for a moment. His great mercy saved us. His great mercy gave us life. I find it interesting oftentimes in what the Bible doesn't say. What the apostles don't say. Peter could have mentioned any number of great things, great attributes, great truths about God that saved us. He could have said, because of his great gift, because of his great love, because of his great sacrifice, because of his great grace. No, here he's, he's focusing on the great mercy of God. And maybe, I can't be sure, but maybe Peter refers to God's mercy because the world around these scattered believers has turned merciless. Their world has turned against them. But it also draws out this wonderful theological truth. By God's mercy, He saved us. Not just in giving us what we don't deserve, that's grace, but in not giving us what we deserve, that's mercy. We're saved because God is not going to give us what we deserve. We deserve His judgment. We deserve hell. We deserve punishment. None of us, and we would readily say it, who are truly converted would ever say, oh, I deserve heaven. Oh, I deserve God's forgiveness. Oh, I deserve everything he's planned for me. No, we don't deserve any of it. In fact, the older I grow in the Lord, the more aware I am of what I really don't deserve about what God is and what God has done and what God gives me. I, I certainly didn't deserve to be born again. I certainly didn't deserve new life. I certainly didn't deserve to have a, a, a fresh start every single day with a promise that even now the blood of Jesus Christ is cleansing me from every sin because I keep sinning. First John 1 7. But God continues to show you and me His great mercy. His great mercy. The Christian upon conversion to Jesus Christ becomes created in Christ Jesus. That's this new life because of His mercy. He brought us from spiritual death to spiritual life, Ephesians 2.10. We become new creatures. We become a new creation, 2 Corinthians 5.17 and Galatians 6.15. We actually 
begin to participate in a new God-given life. And we did nothing to deserve it. God, in his great mercy, gave it to us. Max Lucado wrote a story, a true story. He retold it about a, something that happened in a small, poor village in Brazil, a little hut with a dirt floor, a little red tile roof. There lived Maria, the widow, and her daughter, Christina. Maria's husband had died when Christina was just an infant, and she'd done her best to raise her daughter. And now Christina was an older, pretty teenage girl. The time came for her to seek out employment to help Maria's job, add to the income. Maria was a cleaner, custodian. It was just enough to get food and clothing and shelter, but they eked out this very simple existence. And it was now time for Christina to find a job. Christina had, Lucata writes, this streak of independence in her. She often talked to her mother about fleeing this dusty little village. And uh, she was above being a cleaner. She wanted more out of life. And she often said, I'm going to leave all this behind and go to Rio de Janeiro and the exciting city life there. Her mother would always react in fear and warn her daughter, saying the streets are cruel in that city for a young girl. Her mother was fully aware that if her daughter ever went there on her own, she'd not be able to support herself. Maria knew where her daughter might end up in order to survive, which is why the morning when Maria found her daughter's pallet empty without a note written, her heart filled with fear for what it might mean. After some time, Lucado writes, when it was clear Christina was no longer anywhere in the village, Maria packed her old suitcase and headed for the bus depot. She stopped first on her way at a little drugstore where she took all the money she could possibly spare, stepped into one of those little photograph booths, closed the curtain and took all the pictures that she could afford. Then armed with her bag of clothing and a purse full of little black and white photographs, she headed for Rio de Janeiro. When she arrived, she looked in all the public places, restaurants and malls and even some bars. Maria was nowhere to be found. She looked for days that turned into weeks. She eventually found out uh, some of the parts of the city where there was a reputation for prostitutes. And she knew that Christina had no way of earning money uh, legitimately. When hunger and pride combined, she knew her daughter was stubborn. She'd do anything but return home. So Maria began to comb through the hotels and nightclubs. And wherever she went, she would tape her picture to a wall or a bathroom mirror, or to some kind of bulletin board. She went everywhere she could possibly go, and on the back of each photograph, she had written the same message. Finally, out of money, out of photographs, tired, brokenhearted, Maria went home. It was some time later that Christina, months later, descended the steps of a hotel. She looked across the lobby and saw a familiar face taped to a mirror. She recognized the picture and her eyes filling with tears and her throat burning. She ran across the lobby floor. She pulled the picture off and sure enough, it was a picture of her mother. She touched it and she wept and then happened to turn it over. And when she did, she read the note on the back of the photograph her mother had written that read, wherever you are, whatever you have become, it doesn't matter. Come home. And she did. This is nothing less than the mercy of a mother who refused to give her daughter what she deserved. A life of wandering and emptiness and sorrow all alone. In, instead, she gave her a fresh start. You could say she effectively offered her a new life if she would come home. This is the mercy of God who offers to us who are wandering and pitiful and miserable. We have nothing whatsoever to offer him, and he offers us life and home. The second truth that leads us to thank God is not only for our new life, notice, but our living hope. Verse 3, according to his great mercy, God has caused us to be born again 
notice, to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. In other words, we have a hope that is alive because Jesus Christ is alive. Now keep in mind this word, even the concept of hope, is uniquely Christian. It's a Christian concept. The world knows nothing of this kind of hope, certainly hope beyond the grave. The Apostle Paul describes the unbelieving world in Ephesians 2.12 as having no hope and without God in the world. To the Thessalonians, Paul said that we grieve at the loss of our Christian loved ones, but we don't grieve, he writes, as those who have no what? No hope. In other words, they have no savior. Sophocles, the Greek playwright who died 400 years before the birth of Christ, sort of summarized the, the, the fatalism of, the, of his worldview and the world that would be honest. And even though it, this man was, what we would say, was living the dream, yet he wrote with cynicism before he died. And I quote the translation of what he wrote, not to be born at all, that is by far the best fortune. The second best is as soon as one is born, with all speed, to return from whence one has come. That's, that's the vanity that Solomon mirrors. That's the emptiness of arriving at the end of life without God. In other words, if you have the misfortune of being born, it's best to die young. But when you hear the gospel and you believe it's a gospel that gives life meaning and it gives life hope now understand that hope in the bible is more than a vague wish you know like i, I hope i hope we have pizza for lunch or i hope that that tom brady and the patriots get smeared today <laughs> those are vague wishes and you're probably not supposed to pray about it a vague wish is not biblical hope. Let me add to that. Hope in the Bible is, is more than positive thinking. You don't look in the mirror and say, okay, hey, today's going to be great. You know, that's the sum of it. You know, like that book you read in the elementary school about the little engine, you know, who, who was going up that little hill and he's saying, I think I can, I think I can, I think I can. And you turn the pages as quickly as you could as I did to find out if he made it. And he made it. Oh, it's great. Hope isn't vague wishes. Hope is not positive thinking. Hope in the Bible is defined as certain expectation. And it has with it this sense of anticipation. Our hope isn't dependent on positive thinking or, you know, a lot of pizza or certain football teams experiencing the wrath of God. Wh whatever. No, that isn't it. Our hope, he writes, is grounded in truth. Did you notice? It's tied to what? Our hope is tied to the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, our faith and all our hope is in vain. 1 Corinthians 15, 14. Our, our faith is, uh, is worthless. Same chapter, verse 15. We are still in our sins. Verse 17. We are of all men to be most pitied. We've chased an empty dream. Verse 19, the resurrection is foundational to our hope, our certain expectation. Let me put it this way. Our hope is not dead because Jesus is not dead. Our hope is not empty because the tomb is empty. So our hope is a living hope, Peter writes because we have a living Lord. The third truth that leads us to thanksgiving here is in this text, our eternal inheritance. Notice verse four, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. Wow. In other words, you don't just have a certain expectation you have an eternal inheritance. Now throughout the New Testament, if you're older in the faith, you probably know the believer is called a joint heir or an heir with Christ in Acts chapter 20 and Galatians chapter 3 and Ephesians chapter 3. The idea of the believer 
inheriting from God the Father some inheritance as a joint heir of Christ is, is a rather stunning promise we don't think about enough. But it is the truth. Now in the Old Testament, this idea to the Jewish follower of God, they expected to inherit and their inheritance was the promised land. And we call it the promised land because the land was promised to them as their inheritance. And the New Testament clearly declares that Israel, Paul in, in the book of Romans, says that they will one day be repentant and restored and reconstituted as a nation as Jesus descends to set up the kingdom. The land will be their inheritance. That isn't going to be taken away. They're going to get it. But in the New Testament, the inheritance of the believer is described in fuller detail. In fact, uh, again, this could be a sermon, but we're told, and I'll do it fairly rapidly, that our inheritance includes eternal life. Titus 3, 7. Our inheritance includes the kingdom of God. Matthew 25, verse 34. Our inheritance includes the sealing by means of the Spirit of God, who's our guarantee. Ephesians 1, 14. We're told that our inheritance includes rewards. Colossians 3, 24. Salvation is referred to as our inheritance. That will never be taken away. Hebrews 1.14. In fact, in a moment we'll look at this future aspect of salvation. We're even told that we're going to inherit the earth. Matthew 5, verse 5. It's intriguing to me. All the liberals and all the atheists and all the evolutionists and all those who deny our Creator God who are scrambling to save the earth. Guess what? They're not going to save the earth. God is actually saving it for you. He will recreate it, Peter will tell us later, brand new, as heaven and earth become our inheritance and earth one day will be part of your inheritance as a child of God. This planet. So the earth never really did belong to them, but one day it will belong to you. This is yours. Enjoy it. It's your inheritance. Now Peter describes our inheritance, notice, with, with some interesting words and phrases. He first says it's imperishable. That means pretty much what it says. It's just impossible to experience decay. It isn't going to perish. It isn't going to pass away. You can understand this to mean it isn't going to come to ruin. It isn't going to wear out. It is, it is indestructible. The new earth is going to last forever. It's not going to wind down. And the universe with it. It isn't going to perish. The word also carries the idea of an invading army leaving destruction in its wake. And, and I couldn't help but apply it, of course, to these believers. In their context, the scattered believers are surrounded by enemies. They're surrounded by enemies of the gospel. Their lives have been invaded. Their lives have been disrupted. Their homes and their lands have been taken away from them. Imagine how encouraging it is to be reminded as they read here that their inheritance will never be invaded. It will never be destroyed. It will never be taken away from them. Peter also calls our inheritance, notice, undefiled. Carries the idea of being unstained, unpolluted. It speaks of a coming life that will never be stained by pollution. Imagine the pristine air and the crystal clear water of your newly created planet, have I mentioned, that belongs to you. The word also speaks of life without the stain of sin. It could also be understood as life without crime, without fear. Imagine a life without locks and alarms. Keys are no longer necessary. Wouldn't it be great? You'll never have to ask, where did I put my keys? Where did I put my glasses? Where did I? None of that's going to be. I'm, I'm going I'm to have so much more time on my hands because I'm not looking for my keys or my glasses. And I am getting old. I know it doesn't look like it. But I looked for my glasses the other day and my wife said, honey, they're on your head. <laughs> she enjoyed that chuckle as well. There will be no prisons in heaven. 
No police. Hey, no radar guns. <laughs> Peter is informing these scattered believers and us that our inheritance will be without any stain, without any blemish. Our bodies, certainly, but imagine no stain or blemish on our hearts, our minds. No regrets. Everything about us is as well as our inheritance will be undefiled. Peter adds, notice, it'll not fade away. Now that's interesting. To me, you can render it, it'll not grow dim. The word is actually used in, in classical Greek to refer to the fading beauty of flowers. They, they wilt. Their beautiful color fades away, doesn't it? They dry up. The word also can convey the nuance of losing uh, its freshness, uh, losing its excitement. You know, part of our fallen nature, beloved, is that we get used to stuff, right? We get used to people. We get used to special blessings. We, we, we get used to things. The first time down the roller coaster was the scariest. The first time you went off the high dive was the most thrilling. The, the first time you ever saw the ocean was the most amazing. And you get used to it. I at least ran out on my pickup truck instead of buying it. I thought about buying it. Buying it out, I decided to get a lease on this year's model. Uh, John Heaster, one of our ushers, owns Heaster Chevrolet, and, and uh, so I give my business to him. This is a shameless commercial, hoping he'll give me a break the next time another lease <laughs> comes in. <clears throat> but I, I did it for one reason. They, they have figured out how to put into a pickup truck Wi-Fi. It's moving Wi-Fi, man. I mean, that is, it even has an electrical outlet in the dash. I, I can charge my laptop uh, right there. Uh, the best part of it all, though, is the integration of my cell phone to this uh, uh, panel. So I can have a special plug. I put it in there, and the USB port actually goes into the dash of the pickup truck, and immediately the screen on the truck becomes the screen of my phone. And uh, it's Siri, that, that uh, uh, woman's voice. Uh, I can ask her to read my email. And she'll read my email. I can respond and write email. I can ask her to read my texts. I, I, I can ask her how long I'm going to be in First Peter. And she grows quiet when I, when I ask that. <laughs> it's amazing, though. It's all, it's all hands-free, all voice activation. And, and, but you know what? After I've had this truck now for a few months, it's like, yeah, I'm still talking in my phone. I got used to it. And it's quicker. I'm used to this. I got used to that. You ever wonder, you ever wonder if you'll get tired of gold pavement? You ever wonder if, you know, hey, yeah, the Father's house, wow. Those gems, they're big. I've seen them. You ever, you ever wonder if, 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 if you're not going to be as excited about your heavenly estate that God has prepared for you in the Father's house? You know, after a million years, man, alive, I need to hang some pictures or something. I need a fresh look. Huh? You ever, you ever wonder? Of course you don't. I do, but maybe, maybe you don't. You, you wonder if the flowers and the orchard along the river will lose its vibrancy to you and you'll just get used to it. See, this has as much to say about us as it does our inheritance. Think about it. The, the new earth... The new heavens, the universe, the Father's house, that, that glittering gold home where we have our residence and then we just skirt about the universe doing His bidding. It, it'll never lose its wonder. Uh, the glory of God and the throne of Christ and the, and the royalty of the saints and your clothing of the beloved and even the gems in the father's house and those those gold paved streets no, none of that will ever fade away but it'll never diminish in its freshness to us 
Every day, you know, you're just going to say, wow, you know, that's a, exciting. It's wonderful. We will never get used to it. That's what he's saying. And we will never get over it. Peter writes at the end of verse 4, this inheritance is reserved in heaven for you. By the way, heaven is the safest place you could ever have anything reserved, right? That's one reservation. You never need worry about getting lost in the computer. And as you travel about, they've, they've, somehow you've slipped through the cracks. Chuck Swindoll writes in his commentary on this text and says, when you arrive, some celestial receptionist isn't going to look at you and say, now what was your last name again? Can I see your credit card just one more time? No, he writes, after your long journey through life, the living God will welcome you home without one inch of red tape. Your reservation will never get lost. When you think about our inheritance, it's staggering. It's staggering. I dug around this week to, um, you know, find some, some interesting uh, stories of inheritances left by some wealthy people. Some interesting stories are out there. Uh, two homeless brothers. I found this story. These are true. Uh, in Eastern Europe, they're basically homeless, living together, and they inherited uh, more than one billion dollars from a grandmother they never knew. They had to track these guys down. A woman who left her pet dog ten million dollars. Imagine that. Even Napoleon ordered that when he died, they'd shave his head, and he left his hair to his friends, which I'm sure they really appreciated. I mean, <laughs> wow, that's great. I found the rather tragic story of one of the richest women in Asia leaving her vast fortune to her mystic guru because he promised her that he could guarantee her eternal life. Listen, the only person who can guarantee you eternal life is someone who is eternal. That's exactly what Peter wants us to thank God about in this fourth and final truth that leads us to praise God. Not only can we praise God for our new life, our living hope, our eternal inheritance, but fourthly, God's personal guarantee. He writes in verse 5, who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed at the last time. Not only is our inheritance reserved for us in heaven, Peter tells us that not only is our inheritance, but we are protected by the power of God for this future aspect of salvation which he's going to roll out at the last time. That's the final day of consummation when God ushers us into that new heaven and new earth. Now, very quickly, salvation in the Bible, the New Testament has three aspects to it. There's a past tense aspect. That's where you are saved from the penalty of sin when you placed your faith in Jesus Christ. We call that justification. There's a present tense aspect where you are delivered from the power of sin as you submit to the Spirit. We call that sanctification. And there is a future aspect to your salvation where in heaven you'll be delivered from the very presence of sin. We call that glorification. Now, how can you be sure you're going to make it all the way from justification to glorification? Especially if there's a lot of turbulence, you know, in the middle, in sanctification, right? How do you know? You have God's guarantee. Peter writes that you are even now, present tense, you are even now being protected by the power of God. You're being protected. It's a military word for being shielded, for being guarded, for setting a guard to watch over something important or valuable. So who's doing the guarding here? Who is guarding your inheritance? Who is guarding you? God. You have his personal guarantee. And your inheritance, Peter writes, is coming. It's coming. A couple in our greenhouse class this session recently told me that the church they'd left was a church that had gotten a new pastor. A couple, the couple told me that in one of his sermons, the pastor told his congregation that 
It's been 2,000 years since Jesus promised to return. It's been so long and he hasn't come back. I don't see any reason to believe he will. You know what Peter says here? It's going to happen. In fact, everything's ready. <laughs> ready to be revealed at the last time. Literally, the appropriate time. There is an appropriate time when he's going to reveal the last stage of salvation. And listen, if everything was ready 1,900 years ago, it's really ready now. And you'd better be ready. And you're ready when you accept Christ as your Lord and Savior. Here's the message of God through the inspired pen of Peter. He's writing to wandering, scattered people who wondered if God had lost interest in them. They have no market value. They are scorned by their world. They certainly know they're sinners, but they're sinners who believe in the personal resurrected Savior. So God is telling them and us through Peter this, you are ever wandering and you are ever sinful, but I am great with mercy. You don't deserve to live, but I have given you a new life and every day a fresh start. You are bankrupt and penniless. You've lost everything. But I have given you an incredible inheritance. You'll never lose. You're homeless. You're wandering. You're scattered throughout the kingdom's birth. But I'm guaranteeing that I will, I will bring you home. I like to think of this text as a photograph of God himself here and he's written on the back of the photograph to those who will believe here's what it says it doesn't matter where you are it doesn't matter what you've done because of my great mercy I've given you life and I will bring you home you belong to me no wonder Peter starts us off by saying you know what we ought to be doing we ought to be singing the doxology Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.